I guess as I try to pull um, the questions on the q and I'll just pose uh, a question to you uh, related to the democratization of, uh, of clinical genome sequencing and its integration. Um, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, the example that the, the partnership you had with the, uh, with the NHS is, is just, it's an amazing uh, role model. And I encourage everybody to read the paper that just came out recently in New England Journal of Medicine on the clinical utility of genome in, in, uh, in a, an actual day-to-day -day medicine. And it's just amazing. But my question is, obviously, many, many places um, are not resourced enough to, un, um, you know, to, to develop a, mo a model of, of this nature. And I was just wondering if you please could share your thoughts on a future where we simplify the technical process to the point that all you need is that little bench top machine and everything is done on the cloud for you. You don't need the very expensive infrastructure of bioinformatics and entire team of people to interpret. You have your own variants, they're analyzed on the cloud, just like you can call high Siri and ask whatever, you can have the cloud do uh, you know, most of the work for you. You still feel engaged, you democratize the process and you get many, many people on board with the, with the revolution of genomics. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, please. Yes, well, I think you've touched on, on many of the key areas. Uh, certainly within Illuminar, of course, we can work on the technology. Uh, we can absolutely can, and we do look at miniaturizing our systems. We see today small bunch tops that can do what the big machines could do 10 years ago. And that's a very important area for us. And underlying that is a lot of work, not just on machines and engineering, but also on, on the chemistry, the speed of the chemistry, the accuracy of the chemistry. And one of the, the joys that we have is we have research in all those areas uh, to look at not, not just one part of it, but everything from the fundamental chemistry through to the variant calling through the optics uh, and so on. And that gives us an opportunity to go on evolving the technology. And I think the great thing about these studies, even if they are with large factories and big machines, is that we can see the demand and we can see uh, the impact on medicine and if that is a very important motivator because that motivates technology development if it's not clear if it was a niche market then it'd be much harder or slower to develop that technology but I think we have enough conviction uh, from some of the studies that I showed today that it does work at scale that health systems do want it and I think to tackle one of your other questions, of course, while the technology can help reduce the price and has done over the years, we have gone from 200,000 to 600 dollars per, per genome, uh, and, 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 and we haven't reached the ceiling yet uh, of, of that by, by, by any means. Um, but also, of course, uh, that, the, that, that the cost of the genome now becomes much more commensurate with the costs of other aspects of the health system. And it really is true that if you can keep a child out of intensive care by preventing a treatment, you save thousands and thousands right there. Um, and, and so we begin to, that's an anecdote, but of course then the health systems can begin through these larger studies to really look at the health economies. Uh, and the same is true of cancer. Very expensive treatments uh, which are not matched uh, by genomic information can be a complete waste of time. And we've already seen uh, from, from genomes and from panels uh, that actually the matched, uh, treat, genomically matched treatments in cancer uh, are, are more successful, uh, provide for a longer, greater survival, fraction of the patients uh, uh, going through uh, remission, for, uh, uh, relapse free survival. Uh, and, 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 and there too, that's a very direct link between the use of genomics and the opportunity to actually save money. And I think when every, every society has to be able to make that uh, equation, make those measurements, do the necessary health economic investigations. Uh, it's a hard fact of life uh, and medicine costs money. Uh, and so we have to be able to save money, not spend endless amounts more money. And so we can do our bit with the genome technology. Everybody can help with, with their own perspective, what their own nation needs to get the evidence that goes into the health economics and saves money in other areas as well as saving lives. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bentley. Um, we have many questions. I'll try to uh, field them as efficiently as possible. I'll start with uh, a question to you, Dr. Dejani, after your beautiful talk on, on the epigenetics and, uh, and, and its role in resilience and, and, and psychological trauma. One um, of the audience is asking whether you controlled for the IQ of your patients uh, and whether that may have 
um, co uh, whether this was an overlooked uh, uh, confounding variable in your study. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. Yes, uh, th thank you very much for uh, for the question. Um, it's a very important and valid question. Um, we we do uh, collect demographs and we also assess survey. We do surveys uh, assessing the lit let's say the literacy level. We don't look at IQ because we don't claim that the program impacts. Uh, uh, I mean, no, we do control for the IQ and we look at cognitive testing. So, so I showed the data. I think the question is not about the epigenetics, it's the question about the cognitive uh, data from Brown University. So yes, we do control and we do IQ testing to make sure that that's not what's influencing the improvement in cognition in these children. So that's controlled for. Thank you. Um, two questions to Dr. Habiba Safar. I hope she's still with us. Uh, Doctora, uh, uh, two questions, one pertaining to the uh, uh, public access to the genomes you talked about, and the second is on the stratification within the UAE population, uh, if you please could uh, uh, speak to that. Yes, uh, we have deposited the, the data at the European Genome Phenome uh, Archive, and they have, um, it's mentioned in the publication, the accession number and uh, people can access to this data. Um, regarding the population stratifications, yeah, that's why we did a lot of you know, quality control and when doing principal component analysis to check the diversity of the population in the United Arab Emirates, and also using that mixer population when counting for um, uh, population stratification. Yes, you can see that uh, we have a low uh, population stratification, but we are very, very diverse here in terms of um, you know the genome variants. When we looked at the two individual where they were 99.6 percent Bedouin, also there were six million variants that they are different. So when it comes to the genome data, um, as uh, my colleagues also mentioned, each population or eth ethnic groups they need to look into the admixture of different ethnic group of an individual. As you know, the Middle East has been you know, a crossroad uh, for many, many years, and we have history, we have the religion practice, the gene pool or gene drift, it's very high, you can see it in, in the Dari gene. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, a question to uh, you, Brian, from one of the audience about the uh, challenges in personalizing medications in the era of, of genomics, if you please could comment about that. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, when one talks about sort of therapies uh, associated with uh, with variants and, and and disease, this still represents a, a very very small uh, fraction. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Fazan, you would agree that uh, you know, particularly in rare diseases, uh, there are not a large number of uh, treatments associated with uh, with variants and diagnoses. Uh, I think uh, in my talk, I quoted a figure of something like about five percent of diseases have. Uh, some form of, uh, of treatment uh, I've seen in the literature, for, for instance, you know, with, with some of the uh, earlier rare diseases that, that have been identified, such as cystic fibrosis, that up to 90% of patients have some form of uh, uh, treatment uh, uh, available to them. Uh, and, you know, not, not, not being a physician treating patients in the clinic, uh, I don't know all of the medications that are, uh, uh, that, that are out there. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I can uh, answer that more precisely at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, a question to you, Dr. Bentley from uh, uh, Alice uh, Abdel Alim. She's asking uh, about the uh, $600 uh, price tag that you mentioned and whether this applies to individual samples, um, um, you know, if, if they were to be sent to an outside entity, like uh, including Illumina, or is this something only at scale when you, you know, when you operate at scale, like, you know, the one you mentioned? Uh, in your talk. Uh, you're muted, uh, David. All right, yes. there we go. <laughs> um, yes, a uh, great question. Uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, and it's important to, to have a, a discussion there about it. Uh, you are correct uh, in, in the assumption that this is, of course, at scale, uh, and, and this is make, taking advantage of the economies of scale, <clears throat> which is very different from a small application. 
What I think we're working on, of course, is, as indeed we discussed just a few minutes ago, uh, that given there is an appetite uh, for this at the right price, that it's affordable, that we continue to work on the technology to convert that large scale uh, throughput cost into individual access. Uh, I think the question talked about both about service and about uh, going locally. I think our preference, of course, ultimately is that local centers can do this and can do this at that price. Uh, we've taken one step interestingly recently uh, in, in Africa, I think Egypt was mentioned here, in, in that of course uh, what we are seeking to do is to provide an agreement where the same price is, price is accessible to all regardless of local supply and that's a, that's a re of supply routes and that's a, an area to address in, 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 in that direction. <clears throat> to essentially tri trim out the additional costs that are sometimes associated with technology access to different parts of the world. Uh, and that, that's an ongoing uh, uh, element to, to improving things. So it's not there yet for everybody, no, um, but we do absolutely see that part of the, the real most uh, extreme part of the equitable access to genomes is indeed that the price is equitable uh, uh, across the country and indeed where possible we can make a difference uh, where societies really or individuals just have not got the funds to do it and that's what's behind the I Hope Foundation. This is free uh, to a number of individuals and we can't do free for everybody in the world uh, but we can nevertheless try in different ways to address the question. So we've got the big studies benefiting from government funds or charitable funds to work at the $600 level to accumulate the evidence that continues to fuel the field. Uh, we can work with uh, philanthropic donation uh, in, in areas that are really seeking to get to, 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 to this area in the future and create the new examples. And we can absorb those examples and look at what it would really take to have a benchtop instrument that can do a genome for $600, or dare I say it, less. Um, because clearly if the appetite is there and conferences like this really help to generate that appetite and, and give me feedback as well. Uh, and so it's tremendous to see that sort of opportunity in real time, uh, which, which really uh, pushes us further uh, to, to, to do more uh, for the future. Hey, well, thank you. Uh, I guess uh, before we leave you, uh, uh, Dr. Bentley, there is an interesting question about um, what happens after a negative whole genome and if one can expand on this question to make it very relevant to our discussion where is the where do you see the limit of the technology where we're absolutely confident that yep the technology covered everything it's now a matter of interpretation uh, where do you see uh, the limit of whole genome sequencing using short read sequencing for instance um, as opposed to um, a more uh, general question of you know when do we reach a point where when we tell you this is whole genome sequencing, we are talking about full whole genome sequencing with no gaps and nothing missed. And it's all a matter of interpretation in order to reach a diagnosis. Yes, I, I think it, it's a nice question that dissects out the different shortcomings or the reason that it's not perfect by, by a long chalk yet. I think first thing to say, of course, before genome sequencing and before genomics, the diagnostic rate for these rare diseases in children was a few percent. Uh, three, four, five percent, and now we're up in some cases at 60, 70 percent, depending on the cohort, uh, and, and, and higher for some diseases. So that's a great improvement. So what about the ones that don't get a diagnosis? Uh, absolutely. Um, this is still a, a critical and great area of suffering uh, that the family has to deal with. And I think the fact that the, what we can, all we can offer is, is, is the fact that uh, genomics will continue to improve and, and it is always possible to re-review situations and, and retest. You mentioned long reads. Uh, clearly what I've shown today is that with the short read sequencing, we get a lot of different variant types. We don't get every variant type and so it is perfectly appropriate to consider reflexing to a long read technology, which may take longer and cost more, but if there are certain cases that are really deserving, then that's really important to, to have that capability if indeed the funds, the, the, the finances can, 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 can rise to it. Another very important point there, which, which we also use, is that long reads, of course, then actually, if they do provide the answer that we were missing, we can then see what was missing from the short read data and continue to improve the algorithms. That's what's happening now for a lot of the CNV detection, the structural variant detection, which is particularly amenable to long reads. Uh, and as, as we learn from some of the reference samples, those signals are all there in the short reads, but we didn't know how to look for them. 
And, and that's a, a continuous and nice synergy between long read and short read technology. And we just today discussed in the context of actual patients reflexing to, to long reads. I'll say one more thing, uh, if I have a second here, in that, of course, we don't expect to take a cohort that may have genetic disease and diagnose every single one, because we don't know whether every case in that cohort has a genetic disease. And indeed, if we did diagnose every case in a cohort, uh, we'd have to say that we were not casting the net widely enough. We were probably not selecting individuals that do have genetic disease. So one should never actually get to 100%. Uh, there should be some cases that genuinely are not genetic diseases, and so we will not get a diagnosis. But clearly, we need to continue working to maximize the technology uh, and to better un understand <coughs> how many to include in the study. And of course, I hope as costs continue to drop, then there is less, there is less concern about adding cases into a test. There should be no doubt. It might be a genetic disease. Let's do a genetic test. And then we can include or exclude what we know and then work on, on, on to, as an undiagnosed case. I think we're doing a lot better than we were a few years ago. I think, as indeed, you mentioned. Um, and, and clearly we, we can continue to uh, work with clinical cases to see how much more we can find. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a question to you, uh, Khalid, from one of the audience on the place of genetic counselors in your big uh, genomic medicine program. If you please could speak to that. Uh, um, uh, if you don't mind me just um, adding to what uh, Dr. Bentley just mentioned real quick. Um, you know, we showed some examples where despite a negative genome, we ended up um, sending the patient for metabolomics, and that really helped. Um, the, it, the mutation was there, right? Um, but but that helped us limit um, the scope of what we we're searching at. I think many of us today still sequence genome, but analyze only exome because that's the only part that we actually <laughs> understand fully. Um, so, so I don't think the limitation is with the technology. I have to say that um, having sequenced now thousands of, 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 of individuals with, with rare common diseases, et cetera, I think we're very good at detecting the, the full spectrum of variation that we can do a lot with today. And a lot of it has to be triaged into research. And that's the important part, is we need to think about this beyond the clinic and in research. And that's why we need academic medical centers. We need hospitals that really invest in research. We need ecosystems that invest in research. We need the labs that actually try to do the follow-up work. Um, so I really hope that that's the next step that the Arab world takes in terms of really thinking about where to invest um, for healthcare. Um, but um, uh, to go back to this question on genetic counselors, yes. Uh, so we have we have a genetic medicine department. Um, the way we work, because we are a research sequencing um, uh, effort, um, as, I, as I showed in one of our slides, we triage the data back to the clinician, and then the clinician decides where to take it from there. Sometimes the clinician has enough information to be able to act on it. Sometimes the clinician requires the intervention of a genetic counselor because the patient is syndromic or they touch multiple um, you know, different organ systems and so forth and so on. So I agree this is a big bottleneck in our field. Um, I mean, this is a big bottleneck worldwide. I think you know the statistic in the Arab world is like there's one genetic counselor per million or something, which is a ridiculously low number. We need to work hard on building capacity from the ground up. Uh, Qatar has started some programs. I know that uh, there's programs in Saudi and other neighboring countries. So it's important that our students in the future think about taking that up as a career. Because I think that genetic counselors are the next bioinformaticians. They're going to be you know, the, <laughs> the really rare breed that's going to be very hard to find. And they're going to be the ones that really gel the system together. And so we encourage you to, 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 to pursue that. Terrific. Well, uh, unfortunately, we only have one minute left, so I will uh, utilize it to uh, sincerely thank all the speakers for really terrific talks that um, took us on a journey that covered uh, so much ground. And I'm sure there will be uh, much more to be covered for uh, uh, throughout the rest of the conference. So play, please stay tuned. And I will pass it on to my colleague Riyadh if he wants to say a few words before we conclude this module. Thank you. I would like to thank um, everybody who has made a contribution today. And I think uh, we've come a long way today uh, in this conference. Uh, hopefully, I think we can also touch on common diseases maybe in the next uh, session or two. Thank you very much.